children who never come back, to the children of these children that carry the hurt, the children still searching for home and for the children who, don't, who, who can't find home. We love you, we miss you, sorry. We can stand for the silence. Sorry, day, and uh, and those affected individuals, families, and communities. And we thank our elders and community members who have spoken with us on our journey around the state. And we thank them, and we remember them, uh, and acknowledge their hurt, and re remember them always and thank them for sharing stories with us about those who are no longer with us. <coughs> Council. Uh, thank you, Chair. Today we welcome Uncle Kevin Coombs to the hearing room and uh, Uncle Kevin's family. He is joined today by his daughters, Rose Feller, Janine Coombs, and uh, his grandson, Jordan Coombs. So welcome. Do you solemnly undertake to provide truthful evidence to the Europe Justice Commission at today's hearing? I do. Uh, thank you, Uncle. Um, with the assistance of the staff of your Rook and those assisting them, you've prepared a witness statement. And um, is that witness statement true and correct? Uh, yes. Yeah. What I'm going to do this afternoon is to um, ask you some questions but also play some video and then ask you some questions about a, a documentary that has been I'm Kevin Richard Coombs um, watch your bollock man but um and also, I was born in Wamba Wamba country, in Swan Hill, uh, so many years ago now, uh, as I'm approaching my 81st um, year in life. And could you tell us where is Watchabullock country? Where is Watchabullock country? Oh, Watchabullock country in the Wimmera, mm -hmm. uh, between uh, Dimboola and... Uh, and, and Horsham. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your grandparents. My grandparents? Uh, yes. Um, on the Clayton side, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, we called him Bap. Uh, I, I can just remember uh, um, Auntie, <coughs> his, his, the grandmother, Nelly, uh, Nelly Briggs, she married Tommy Clayton. Um, Tommy Clayton originally come from uh, Goresta up near uh, Darlington Point, up around that area. And uh, no, great, great uh, to me as, as, a, as a grandfather, he, when, when um, we had a lot of trouble maybe at uh, at home, there was too much 
uh, alcohol around for us, so he'd, he'd pack us up in a horse buggy and we'd go down to um, Heathcote. Where And your great-grandfather, Albert Coombs, he was also born in the Wimmera? Yes. So tell us about him. Um, Albert Coombs, um, I, I didn't know too much about him, but um, I, I knew um, um, Alfred Jackson Coombs, who, who went to the um, First World War in France. He didn't go to Anzac, thank God. Uh, him and his, his brother Bill, Billy, he was 15 when he went to war with, with um, hard to imagine uh, going to war when you're 15, but he did. He went over there with his big brother. They fought over there for uh, four to five years in, in, uh, in France. He come back because they were badly gassed, gassed and uh, um, I think they were injured. Um, but uh, I can't remember grandfather, but I can remember Uncle Bill. Um, and he he um, didn't like to be around people. He him and his wife would go off. And you wouldn't see him for another six weeks because it, you didn't you didn't want to be around people mm -hmm. because it, uh, of what he went through in the, that first world war. Mm. You tell us in your statement that when your grandfather went to sign up when he went to enlist, he got yes. knocked back the first time. Yes, I understand so. Yes. And then he signed up under a different name. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, in fact, he also signed up in another place, didn't he? He signed yes. up in Bendigo. He went went to Bendigo, I think, mm. and signed up there. Mm. But uh, uh, we wonder why a lot of our people, uh, um, you know, sort of change their name. Mm. Uh, Do you know why he had to change his name? Um, no, I don't. Mm. Um, when he came back from the war, um, you, you said that it was his, your grandfather's brother who was gassed? Bill, yeah. Yeah. And uh, how was he health-wise after his return? No, he was, he was uh, what I call it nowadays, uh, uh, stressed out. Um, what would you say? PTSD. PTSD, PTSD yeah. yeah Post-traumatic stress yeah, disorder. That's yeah, that's right. Mm. As it's known today, but uh, um, as I've said, he, he didn't want to be around people. His life was uh, Bush, mm. him and his wife, yeah, mm. Marty Bridget. Mm. And your grandfather was awarded medals for his service. Yes. Uh, the Victory Medal and the British War Medal. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you have a photograph that we can share with the commissioners. Uh, of the coin minted with details <coughs> of his um, service that we might, that's on the screen now. Yes. Yeah, so that's in a little case. Could you tell us about the case that was made to hold that coin? Well, <laughs> this uh, gentleman uh, from Adelaide, I don't know how he got involved with that, but he knew that the, the Coombs had come from up around Swan Hill Way. Mm. So he got in touch with the RSL up there and who knew nieces up there, so she uh, passed on my details to him mm. and he said, said to me, uh, he, he contacted me and said he, he's not going to put it in the mail, he said I want to take it from my hand into your hand mm. because I don't trust anyone because it's a very important medal and uh, that's it there and uh, I'm very, I said, said to him, I said you put a uh, a big smile on an old man's face, mate. Mm. And uh, 
I'm very proud of that, and, um, and so is our family. Mm. Yeah. You can't see it in that photograph, but around the edge of the coin is the inscription is service. Yes. Yeah. like they were treated um, before they went. They were just uh, another black fella, I guess. Mm. But um, just <coughs> it was very, uh, very uh, pleasing to get that, that back and, and uh, to end up um, being friends of the person that um, now that mm. I and they called him Happy Jack and that was my grandfather mm. um, he was in uniform and he looked very much like my young brother mm. who, who was a strong fit <laughs> um, looking like um, and he could fight like a thrashing machine. Mm. So, uh, um, it was it was a, a great thing to see. Really, mm. they, they sent they sent photographs, and they they said this. They sent it to the Curry Heritage Trust here in Melbourne, mm. and said, "Did you know any Coombses?" And they said, "Yes," because I was on the board of the Curry Heritage Trust at the time. And they said, "They passed it on to me." his family returning and missing out on soldier settlement of properties. Oh, yeah. Were, were your, was your grandfather and uh, great-granduncle in the same category? They, yes. they came back and they missed out? Yes. And I, I, uh, I was on a, a radio program uh, one day uh, with uh, John Payne. John Payne, when he was... Uh, when he was... Uh, had the radio... Uh, program on the ABC in the mornings and I said to him, uh, he asked me the same question and I said, well, I'm still waiting for our land. Mm. You know, the, if you went to war, you got a soldier settlement block, but um, mm. he said, Kevin, he said, I don't think you're going to get it. Mm. <laughs> this is only a couple of years back. Mm. But uh, that's the way it was, I guess, at the time. Mm. And just before I leave um, your grand parents, um, your, your great-grandfather Albert Coombs, you say he was a bit of a radical. Uh, he was uh, making requests uh, to the management of the mission on, at Ebenezer for, yes. for leave to do various things. I said in my statement, I think I said, I wonder what um, my great grandfather would think uh, of me today, um, what he would uh, have me say today about that. Mm. Because he wanted um, more blankets and he wanted more uh, sheep mm. uh, to survive and he wanted. wanted uh, he used to write to, I suppose, at the time, he, he'd write to survive, really. Mm. So this is the 1870s. Yes. Um, to have some sort of self-sufficiency or independence, he needed to seek permission from either the mission management or the Victorian Parliament, did he? Yes. The government. He was, he'd gone over the head of the... The mission manager, I think, mm. and that's where he got himself into trouble. Right. Well, they weren't too happy with him writing the letters. No. <laughs> so what happened? Uh, I'm not sure, really. Yeah. Um, you tell the tell that he um, kept getting kicked off the mission. That's right. right. He, he, uh, 
he ended up leaving uh, uh, Ebenezer and, and, and stayed at a place called Antwerp. Mm -hmm. Antwerp, yeah. Hmm. Um, tell me about your parents. My parents uh, were terrific. Uh, uh, Cecil uh, Coombs, and he was a drover and a, and a uh, woodcutter mm -hmm. uh, because uh, uh, there wasn't a lot of money around in those days. You had to go out and uh, no, no sit-down money, they, as they call it, at, at different times. Um, he married <coughs> Rosie Clayton. It's a rose I've got now. <laughs> Named after you, your mum. My, my mum, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, they, were, they were wonderful uh, people, but mum, mum died when we were, when I was uh, five, mm. and I was the uh, uh, the middle middle child of our family. We had five kids and in the Coombs family, and um, her um, her sister was Auntie Sylvia, Sylvie Murray, uh, just it out. So uh, she said, you're not going anywhere, you're not going to the those terrible uh, orphanages, so you're coming with us. They had two boys, mm. Ray and Ali, mm. and, um, and we went and stayed with them, and they brought us up, and made sure we went to school and uh, um, we, were, we were, were pretty well looked after. They, they looked after us pretty good. Okay. We have um, a photo of your parents' wedding, I think, yes. that we'll bring up and share. So hopefully you can see that, Uncle. Who's, who's in that photograph? Sorry? Can you tell us who's in that photograph? Yeah, that's uh, are you s this bloke down the bottom. Is On the left-hand side, yeah. The left-hand side, that's uh, 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 Shot Pierce. From and Dad, of course, Mum, and then Auntie Sylvie, mm -hmm. Sylvie Murray. Who, who ended up looking after you. Yeah, and that car, for instance, is owned by... Um, uh, Billy Briggs, mm -hmm. who happened to be, you might have heard of uh, Paul Briggs? Yes. His father. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I said to Paul one day, I said, that car would be worth a lot of money today, wouldn't it? <laughs> he said, sure it would be. <laughs> so they're handsome looking, uh, yeah. why won't they? they are. Lovely. A beautiful photograph. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. Um, so Auntie Sylvie, who's there on the right of the photo, yes. took you into care when uh, uh, Sylvie, Sylvie Murray, her, her, um, her husband, uh, Ronnie Murray, or Rid Ridley Murray, he... Um, he did very well because uh, he, he had the contract at Bell Reynolds mm -hmm. to supply all the timber for the uh, steam uh, room at the, the, the hospital. Mm -hmm. So he'd supply, well, he did very well uh, just after the war. He had his own truck, he had his own block of land, he had his own sawmill, he had his own car. So he did very well. Mm. And um, uh, we were brought up pretty good. Okay. And that, um, when I say that, they call him Shot. Um, his name was Tom, Tommy Pierce. Okay. And um, Tommy Pierce was, uh, he was always wearing uh, uh, bandanas of red, you know, with saying that uh, he, was a, he was an outlaw of, um, of um, social justice, I suppose, and he was... Um, he was saying that uh, he'd always wear red. Mm -hmm. And we, a lot of our people used to call him shot, big shot. Big shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, 
Uncle, you've held many important positions in your life, um, including in health, disability, sport, justice. <coughs> and what we have is a, um, a documentary, which is Understanding Uncle Kevin Coombs, that was made involving yourself speaking. Yeah. So if you're happy with this, what I'll do is I'll play a segment and then we can talk about it and we'll, we'll go through it that okay. way. Um, but um, the first part is going to show you at the Olympics, so we will definitely come back to that. Let us welcome into the stadium five athletes in whom the fire burns brightly. Ladies and gentlemen, the bearers of the flame. Kevin Coombs, Paralympian, Rome Tel Aviv, Heidelberg, Arnheim, Stoke Mandeville. And here we see Kevin Combs, who has competed in five Paralympic Games, all in wheelchair basketball. Clayton, and my dad was uh, Cecil Coombs. I had uh, four siblings and uh, two brothers and two sisters. When mum died, we would look like we were heading towards the Cootamundra, you know, those terrible homes that they sent kids to. But uh, mum's next sister down, she said, you're not going anywhere, you come come home to move with us. Because her and uh, her husband had two boys. He tells a story that there was two kids went to bed and seven woke up in the same bed next morning. It was of 1953. I can remember it like it was yesterday because um, that did change my life. We were shooting rabbits. One of my cousins had a gun and I had a gun. And, uh, and we were, he was 14 and I was 12. And uh, we had a couple of uh, younger cousins tagging along uh, behind us and we decided to uh, stop and have a bit of a rest. One of the kids, a little nine-year-old, he was playing with my gun uh, and I left a bullet in it and I heard the click and I thought, I think there might be a bullet in that and he fired it and it was about three, three foot for me and uh, hit me in the back and it came out under my heart. A lot of people did. It was uh, pretty tough because in 1953 they, they didn't have a clue how to, uh, if you had a spinal injury in those days, you only lived for about five weeks. I had uh, 24 stitches in my stomach where they operated on me to take my spleen out and me, uh, me um, get the bullet out. And they didn't, didn't really know how to look after me and they'd wash me in the morning and they wouldn't touch me until the next day. And I'd be... The children's hospital, a nurse took me dressing down to have a look and she promptly... Uh, Faded, 
and then uh, threw up, threw up and then fainted, I should say. And I thought to myself, laying on my stomach, because it got a bit of work to do here. <laughs> but uh, they did tell me that uh, I'd never walk again. The reason why I was being sent to Melbourne because they they couldn't they didn't know how to look after me up there, and it's got to be better if you you're in a big hospital like the Children's, and and then out to uh, the Austin. To the men's ward. In '54, there was no uh, Aboriginal uh, organisations or no services that, at all for Aboriginals, uh, so it was pretty, pretty tough. And uh, I had nowhere to go. I didn't know anyone down here. For a little uh, kid at 12 years old, you know, was really uh, involved with the family, um, heavily involved with with the community and where I come from. And uh, not to see another black, black face was pretty tough. At times where I think, what the hell's going to happen to me? You know, what, what am, where am I going to end up? Uh, what am I going to do? Or which way is my life going? I had to concentrate on, on what was happening around me, like with school and, and uh, physio and um, getting fit and, and healthy to, to face what whatever life uh, was coming my way. When the Austin set up the, the spinal injuries unit, uh, they wanted everyone off the ward um, by seven th uh, 8 o'clock, I should say. Everyone had to be off on their programs. In the morning it was the carpentry shed, then over to playing sport in the afternoon. I can see what they were Uh, for, to, for work and um, it was a little bit like boot camp because if you didn't get up uh, and have a shower and a shave and uh, shoes were shiny and, and uh, you're ready for breakfast you didn't get any. A couple of years back I went out to, to lunch with about four of my old mates and we looked at their shoes and they're all very shiny shoes because this, uh, the bloke had run the, the spinal injuries ward was very particular about that you had to have shiny shoes. And I said, why? He said, well, when you're going for a job in an interview, you wheel through the door, first thing is your feet go through the door. And he said, that's the way to impress the boss. Us old blokes are sitting around the table, I said, he's got shiny shoes. <laughs> They've all got shiny shoes. <laughs> so we learned something, I suppose. nurses <laughs> and we used to train very hard because we didn't want to be uh, just sitting around the water all the time when we were, were playing sport and after the program had finished we'd and you know daylight saving come along um, it was still uh, light enough to play after uh, after dinner so we we go over there and uh, throw the ball around and uh, hopefully a couple of nurses will come and watch us <laughs> That's the way it was. Well, um, um, before the accident, growing up in um, Bell Rannell. Oh, Rannell, yeah. Yeah. Um, what was your experience of growing up in the town there and going to school there? Um, well, in, in the early days, my... My uh, hometown of Bell Reynolds was a fairly racist town because uh, the reason why I say that, they had two schools, one for the blacks, one for the whites. And uh, uh, my elder sister had a lot to do with changing all that because uh, Dawn, her name was, she owned the, the Rue Works up there. And the Rue Works employed a lot of people in the town as shooters, uh, Skinners, and uh, so my, uh, I could go up there at the weekend and shoot about 20 roos, or that'd pay for my weekend. Mm. 
but after that was all the rules were had to be tagged, you had to be a professional tutor. You couldn't do that anymore because she had she had uh, a lot of those people that were on on her payroll uh, were. Kids were small, and uh, the girls were small, and we'd uh, come home from work and throw the uh, throw all our gear in the car, and away we'd go. Five hours later, we'd be having uh, dinner with uh, my sister, and, uh, but she passed away some years ago now, so that doesn't happen. But I get up there occasionally. Mm. Did you experience that racism at school? Uh, Oh, yes, we did, but uh, they, they let us, the teachers let us sort it out ourselves and we used to go beyond the shelter shed. And mm. oh, so it mostly was from the other students? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, they, I've got to say, mm. they were uh, pretty good in this. A lot of those fellows that... Uh, mm. uh, in the picture theatres around town, places like that? Yeah, well, the, uh, when we used to go to Saturday afternoon uh, movies, the Aboriginals used to sit on one side, the whites on the other side, and, uh, and same with uh, the cafe that we used to go to. We wouldn't get served if we went in the front door, we had to go in the side door. Mm. So that did happen, yeah. mm. And have you seen that sort of racism persist over your lifetime, or do you think it's improved? Uh, no, I, I think it's improved a hell of a lot, mm. and so it should. Uh, except to say, when when I uh, was playing uh, top level basketball, so I think we were in. Uh, I can't remember Tel where Aviv, we were, but mm. the, uh, this, um, uh, we were in there, I was with my mate, Billy Mather Brown from West Australia, mm. he was in our team and uh, he drinks coffee or, or tea and I was having a cold beer and uh, this Zimbabwean bloke came in and said, uh, oh they're open uh, their uh, bars for niggers nowadays. Uh, so I did um, feel that in my international uh, career, mm. but uh, my uh, Australian manager, I went back and told him, and he said, point him out to me tomorrow. So we went down for breakfast the next morning. This bloke, this Zimbabwe bloke, he was bright red. You could see he had a big knot on the grog. <laughs> and, uh, Grabbed him by the shirt, stood him up like that, and um, said, "Don't you ever talk to one of my boys like that ever again." Mm. So threw him aside, mm. and uh, I got to say, um, a Zimbabwe uh, bloke uh, never left my side uh, for the rest of the games, and he was a very good friend in the end. Mm. Um, and. Uh Did you lose connection with your father at some point? Sorry? Did you lose connection with your father at some point after your mum died? Oh, yeah, well, he was, he was a, a woodcutter and he, he, he uh, was working up at Mansfield mm. and uh, before that, Pecola, the, the, the bloke who owned the two sawmills, uh, Seth, my dad, used to, when it got quiet at Pecola, it, they sent him to Mansfield mm. and he worked on the mill there and uh, uh, one of his mates rang me and said, listen, there's something wrong with your dad. You better come up and uh, 
because they didn't want him to be staggered. They thought he was on the grog, but he, he was, um, he had Hodgkin's disease, which is a cancer of the neck. And um, he was uh, sort of staggering a bit, and they didn't want him to be falling around where these big sores are going around. So I went and got him and brought him down. have a couple of beers and when he was coming home to my place right, right in Collingwood he'd uh, step off the, the gutter and he fell back and cracked his head and uh, uh, then it went the cancer went rampant right throughout his body because uh, um, I went in to see him he, he said he, he wanted a, a conning which means he wanted to use his bowels Mm. And he, um, uh, they were filling him up with. to block him. And because when I went in there a couple of days later, because he was getting angry and he was sort of waving his arms around, uh, this Indian doctor said to me, um, Can you sign here? I said, what, what am I signing? He said, We're going to commit him. I said, you've got a what? You know, if I could have reached across him, I'd have punched him because I had pretty big arms in those days when I was fit and healthy. Uh, and I was so upset, I went home and rang my sister straight away and said, you better come down here tomorrow because uh, uh, they want to commit him, uh, my dad, our dad. So uh, uh, she took him home to Bell Reynolds and he put him to the hospital up there and uh, she used to go up and every day to pick him up and take him down to her Roo Works where she had the Roo Works and uh, a lot of his old mates be there and they'd be, uh, you know, out at the hospital with what was wrong with him in the end when he was in hospital oh yeah yeah, yeah I, I did tell him uh, in no, certain terms yeah yeah um just coming back to the d the accident that you <coughs> described in the video uh, yes. the shooting accident uh which uh ended up well, you were 12 years old out rabbiting with your cousins yes and uh, I want to ask you about the immediate aftermath of that shooting. That you don't you don't mention that on the video. But how did you get from the riverbank where you'd been shot into hospital? Tell us about that. The opportunity to get all that wood and sell it to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And he had a contract with the hospital. So we, we did that. And uh, uh, to, to uh, sorry, can I ask? Yeah, sure. So I was asking about the accident on the river oh, yes. where your cousin yeah. shot you. Yes. And uh, uh, you, were you unconscious afterwards or were you still conscious? Yes, yes, I was. Because uh, I can tell you the story, Stuart Murray. Yep. And I understand. What Clean it and polish it, and uh, it was it was one of those old box halls. From, uh, I think he got it from England in those days. Yeah, had the doors used to open that way. Yes. And um, <laughs> he was, um, his son was Gary Murray. I don't know whether you heard of Gary. Um, Gary's pretty well known now, nowadays. But uh, Stuart was a, a great, great bloke to be. And he was, um, he saved my life. He, he, um, he run down in my, uh, in his car and threw me in the back and Auntie T. Um, 
instead of uh, opening up gates, we were about, if you, if you imagine we were going to Robinvale, we were six mile, six, 16 mile in, and there was a lot of gates between um, then to, to the highway so we can get to, to Bellwell. And as I said, Stuart used to polish the scarf. <laughs> and um, by the time we got, because all those gates, he didn't bother opening them, he just drove straight through them. <laughs> and by the time we got to the highway, the headlights were hanging off it <laughs> and it damaged the um, um, radiator. So what happened, about a mile out of town, we cooked the motor. And so Stuart had to run out um, to a, a, an Italian farm to ring the ambulance. And um, they got, got me to hospital. Then they were running around what, with their heads cut off to find out what blood group I was. So um, fortunately, uh, he laid in the next bed to me and he pumped blood straight into me. Stuart did? Yes. Yeah. And that saved me. And, and till it stabilised me till I went to Swan Hill that night to uh, operate on me and to get part of the bullet out. Yes. Mm. Um, and how long were you, did you stay in the Swan Hill Hospital after that surgery? Well, as I said, they didn't know anything about how to look after paraplegic people. As I said, in the, we were, I was laying in the, the own mess uh, at the Swan Hill Hospital. I had 24 stitches up the stomach. Mm. And for me to pass urine, the doctor used to do handstands on my stomach because mm. they didn't know about catheters and all, all that like they do nowadays. But uh, um, so I got this huge bed sore mm. and uh, it was getting into my blood system. So when I stayed there, I'd have died. Mm. Uh, that's why they sent me down to Royal Children's. Mm. And that was the wound was obviously very severe. That oh, the yeah. nurse had the reaction she had when she saw it. Well, I, I lay, had to lay on my stomach for twelve months mm. after uh, and a lot of operations, skin grafts, and God knows what. But I had to lay on my stomach for twelve mm. months. So uh, you were at the Royal Children's Hospital for yes. twelve months. Oh, or more, that, longer, yeah. and then moved across to the Austin for the rehabilitation program. Yes, yeah. That um, was known as the home for the incurables, and the Austin was mm. so. <laughs> to take, but before I get to that, uh, you also mentioned. Um, the loneliness of being in hospital for that pe for that period, long period of time, yeah. without seeing any family. Can you just tell the commissioners about a little bit about that? Yeah, well, uh, I didn't see another black face for two years, and that uh, for a kid, twelve years old, uh, thirteen years old, is a big impression because uh, uh, eventually uh, the system in charge knew everyone who's who in, in Melbourne, I guess, and she got in touch with Sir Doug Nichols, and uh, he happened to be um, Stuart Murray's father-in-law. So um, they'd come to visit me, and uh, uh, I, was, I was pretty crook, and uh, I had... Um, But those guys, uh, Stuart and Sir Doug, um, came out to see me and said, it's time to stop lying around, boy. you got to start moving. And they got me going. Mm. And uh, that, that's what happened mm. uh, then. But I'm ever grateful for Sir Doug and Stuart. You've saved your life a couple of times. Oh, perhaps. yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I want to ask you about the sport now. And uh, just before I come to the, your extraordinary uh, sporting career. 
after hospital, so you, sp you spent about 10 years all up in hospital, yes. various hospitals, um, and you started to play sport through that time as part yes. of your rehabilitation. And uh, you moved out to a hostel in St Kilda when you were about 22 years old. That's right. Yep. Uh, was that a supported hostel? Was that um, a church group or, or some other? Um, it was run by the Crippled Children of Victoria. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what what they call them nowadays, but uh, they had a, a place. We own flat. Um, so let's come to the sport, uh, and um, we'll just play an, another little segment of video, but we have seen at the opening of this documentary you being the torch bearer yes. uh, for the Sydney game, so. We uh, created Paravix in 1964 to get the grass me, uh, roots athletes Can we turn it up to a so level where they could uh, go on and be Paralympians. In the early days, when we were, when we were in the Austin, uh, Affairs. Uh, we didn't want to be a subcommittee to anyone. So we all put a dollar in each. There was 11 of us. All the members were under 25. From that little start, uh, we're now where we are, which is uh, fantastic really because it, it, it uh, went on to be a very good uh, thing for a wheelchair sport to start with. Uh, it was known as Paravix and then it became wheelchair sports and now it's become Disability Sports Victoria. And uh, that... Disability. In 1960, um, I was in the Australian team to go... Can we just, to, can we just um, pause there for a sec? To yep. that guy on the right. Yes. There's Bruno Moretti. We, we just lost him uh, about a month ago. Mm -hmm. uh, him, him and I went to... The, First Paralympics in 1960 mm -hmm. in Rome, yeah. But he was a, he was a great bloke. He was a, my best man at my wedding. He was my godfather, my daughter's, eldest daughter's godfather. Uh, so, yeah, we just lost him about a month ago. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. To Rome as an 18 year old boy, and um, I had to get a passport. So, uh, at the time, the, the government could tell you how many cattle were in this country, how many sheep were in this country, but they couldn't tell you how many Aboriginals were in this country. I had to go and, and to represent my country on an honorary um, British passport. And uh, that sort of still sticks in the guts a bit. But um, that's the way it was at the time. supposed to be in, uh, in Moscow, but uh, Moscow told uh, the International Committee, they said there's no disabled people in Russia. So they, they had them in uh, a little place called Arnhem in Holland. It was really brilliantly run, and, but it was really uh, frightening because uh, after the German games uh, with you know, the massacre of the, the Israelis, it became very Sad to see, but uh, going to our different sports, we had to go with with uh, uh, army sizes with uh, guns and machine guns, and you know, guarded all the way, and uh, and we felt. Uh, a part of that, uh, just getting away from you know the, the goodness of sport. The last games was based in England, Stoke Mandeville, where it all began. That's what I first, uh, or second time I'd met uh, Prince Charles. He, he uh, uh, opened the games in, in 84 in England, 
and Lady Di was there with him at the time. And uh, again, I was the captain of the Australian team and, and that, again, all the other teams were just giving him little badges and that. But I gave him one of these, these Akubra hats and I said to him, uh, he put it on and I said, at the pink pussy. Um, so, Uncle, you were going to represent your country at the highest level of competitive sport and you couldn't get a passport. That's right. And uh, that's because Aboriginal people weren't recognised as Australian citizens that's right. in 1960. Yeah, you've got to think, uh, 1960, we didn't get our rights till 1967. So, uh, uh, it's a long time, but... Uh, the way it was at the time, and um, I got, uh, I thought about it. Uh, Kokoda, uh, for the Japanese, and the Kokoda track. Um, the, um, they went there with without passports too. Mm. So I thought about that and thought, well, uh, it's true. Mm. Um, yeah, that, that was, uh, think about things and you think, uh, well, it's not all about me, but it's about other people too. Yeah. Mm. In fact, um, not only were you not recognised as a but Aboriginal people were dealt with That's by right. a piece of legislation yes. uh, described as flora and fauna. Yeah. Yeah. And you've mentioned that to me in our conversations as something that uh, you weren't happy about. No. Um, you mentioned uh, earlier the incident of racism from a fellow from the Zimbabwean team uh, in 1968, that was in Tel Aviv that yeah, happened. Yes. Um, playing sport at that highest level, the competitive level, did you experience any other sort of racism from your team or from other teams? Or was it a place where you're all on a par? Um, at an international level, uh, I didn't experience uh, any other apart from that one. Um, there was one, one, uh, one case, uh, it was a South Australian uh, respect. That's the only two. Uh, yeah. You mean he was playing on you? Yes. Yeah. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, and you also said that you met Prince Charles a couple of times. Well, I met him a couple of times, yeah. yeah. You mentioned giving him the Akubra hat in the video, but yes. you, you gave him another gift. I gave him another gift, yeah. Tell, uh, us, tell us about giving him that gift. <laughs> and, uh, oh, I did, did not know anything about the security around the royals because, uh, uh, as I said, my team manager was a very Australiana type guy. And he had this uh, uh, I had, had, had this axe under my chair, <laughs> like that. So I reached out, I said, I've got another present here for you. And I reached out and pulled this <laughs> axe out. <laughs> In case of that, you know, uh, the Royal, Royal Highness, your mm. Prince of Wales, I think he was at the time. Um, um, I, and my mate was sitting behind me, the big Queenslander fella. Uh, he, he said that the security was just about to dive on me.
gave them all a turn, no doubt. <laughs> Can I just touch on some of your sporting achievements? Um, you mentioned the Olympics, 1960. You went in um, 1968. So no, 1972, you were captain of the men's wheels yeah. wheelchair. Can I, can yeah. I say I didn't go to... In 1964, they had the, the Tokyo Games. Yes. And the reason why I didn't go to that, I discovered women. Oh, <laughs> a few distractions. But I, uh, I uh, caught one, and she's still with me. <laughs> so we'll, we'll hear you talk about okay. your wife in a moment, okay. but... Um, Basketball team, Paralympics in Heidelberg, 74, captain of the Australian men's wheelchair basketball team, the Commonwealth Games, and you were civil, silver medalists, Commonwealth Games. 77, the Silver Jubilee Games, Stoke Mandeville, that was mentioned on the video, that's when you saw Prince Charles again with the racing axe. 1980, uh, captain of the whole Australian team at the Paralympics in Holland, in Arnhem, Holland. 83, captain of the Far East and South Pacific Championships in Hong Kong. 83, captain of the Australian team at the Gold Cup World Championships in Halifax, Canada. And then 84, captain of your fifth and final Paralympics, Stoke Mandeville in the UK. And uh, that's when you gave Prince Charles the Akubra. That's right. Yeah, an extraordinary, an extraordinary career, if I may say so. And we might just bring up the certificate from the IPC. Uh, so for your special achievement as a Paralympian upholding the Paralympic values, you are granted use of post-nominal letters PLY. That certificate is in recognition of your extraordinary contribution to sport, Uncle. At Peter Poynton's Hotel in, in uh, straight up in Grattan Street, straight up at the Women's Hospital. A mate of mine I shared an office with in North Melbourne. Uh, he used to be a part-time barman there, so he said, drop in and I'll buy you a couple of drinks. Uh, at six o'clock the, the music started, so I went around the corner and uh, just had a look and see who was in the, in the room. And it was Linda and her two brothers and a couple of nurses from the Austin that I knew, so I went over and said g'day to him and it started from there, I suppose. <laughs> Linda took me around to meet her. Then, and you could hear them right coming down the passageway, they're bumping. Bumping the wharf. I heard the door open. Oh, he's in a wheelchair. Oh, he's back. And I said, got a bit of work to do here. <laughs> but uh, they, were, they were wonderful people, uh, very supportive of me. And uh, when they knew I was, I was marrying their granddaughter, one of my old aunties said to me, you married a, why, why are you marrying a white woman? And I said, uh, probably because I love her. Of the, little angels. the spinal injury <laughs> unit at the Austin, and I rang him up one day and I said, "What's the chance of uh, me having kids?" He said, "Same as me winning tats." And I rang him up and uh, said to him, "I said, mate, I'm never going to buy you a tats ticket because <laughs> of, of uh, my wife's pregnant." Very proud of uh, both my girls. Uh, Janine, who's been the eldest, she's now the chairperson of the Federation of Indigenous Land Councils right throughout Victoria, and she's also the chairperson of the Baraji Gadjan in, in Horsham, where our ancestors originally from. Rose is my youngest girl, and, and uh, 
uh, she's magistrate in Victoria. So we're very proud of both the girls and uh, what they've achieved. It's not all doom and gloom in Australia about poor Aboriginal people. There's a lot of smart kids around now that given the opportunity, uh, we've got doctors and we've got uh, magistrates, we've got lawyers, we've got teachers and uh, it just goes on and on. Uncle, I want to come now to, there you are shaking the former Prime Minister's hands in that shot, uh, Prime Minister John Howard at the time, by the look of it. Um, Uncle, I just want to move to your working life, but I want to ask you if that's a good time to have a break. Would you, would you like to have a short no, no, break? No, keep, keep going? Yeah, yep. thank you. Um, so let's, let's come to... for Aboriginals in late uh, 1979. So what was that employment strategy? Um, well, it was with um, the community services um, for a 12 months thing. After 12 months, they could uh, wash their hands of you and it was up to you to go out and do something yourself. Yeah. But uh, when, uh, when the 12 months finished, uh, with community services, I, I was out of a job and uh, uh, we used one or two of them worked the printing machines and they printed a hell of a lot of uh, Christmas cards, you know, personal stuff. Mm -hmm. personal Christmas cards okay. and, and uh, so when that closed down the, the woman that run that uh, she got uh, uh, all the people that was the working there jobs and uh, because of her, she was in the printing industry she got a couple of uh, people working in the printing industry and they got she got me because she knew I could talk a bit, she uh, she got me a job at Collie's Inks. An interview at Collie's Inks, and I was there for 15 years. Right. Um, after your traineeship, you were approached by the National Committee for the International Year of the Disabled yes. to be a representative on that on the committee. Yeah. And tell us about that work, that work that had you travelling and yeah, speaking. It was. It was uh, uh, Charles Perkins was the secretary of the, uh, the Department of Aboriginal, uh, the Federal Department of Aboriginal Affairs, mm. and he said, "I know there's a there's a bloke down in in Melbourne that can." Talk. <laughs> so I'd like him to be on that uh, uh, committee. So that's how I've become on that national committee, and a lot of people. Uh, the, the, on the national committee, uh, sort of uh, like what what I was doing, because a lot of people in Victoria, because I was working with the the uh, health commission at the time, that uh, everyone knew I was in a wheelchair, but they didn't see me as looked on me as, as disabled because I'd jump in my car and go to Mildura. And uh, um, because of that, mm. they never saw me as a, a disabled person, except I couldn't walk. Mm. And that's what, <coughs> that's what the, uh, the International Year of the Disabled was. Mm. And to, um, even today, but, uh, Upstairs, mm. how can you get up there? Mm. There's no no lift or anything like that, mm. and uh, so I won't go to places like. Well, should I? 
you use that role on the committee to um, lobbying to make sure Aboriginal people got a better deal with housing and health and yes. issues like that as well. Um, t tell us about um, the travel that was involved, including to Western Australia, where you travelled to Western Australia and heard language for the first yes. time. Yep. Well, <coughs> uh, I went there um, because the international view was disabled, and uh, I went to uh, uh, Derby, room in Derby. Uh, Derby was where they had the leprosarium, and, and I've never seen that before, nor did I think it was in the, in, in Australia. But there was, and I went went there and I seen people with uh, holes in their hands, holes in their feet, um, and their hands are like that. And and I said, uh, I went and shook hands, and they said to me, uh, "Just be careful." That, thought there would be leprosy around, mm. but uh, there was, and it was, uh, I'm very glad I went there because it, there was about 350 people there in this uh, leprosarium. They had their own jail, they had their own uh, bakery, they had their own uh, everything, you know, mm. so they were like they were isolated community mm. and, and uh, looked after each other, mm. but uh, it was a sad thing to see really. Derby called Mwanjam. Yeah. Is that am I pronouncing it correctly? Um, how did you pronounce it? Mwanjam. Oh, Mwanjam. Uh, uh, I just added that. Yep. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> I've yeah. put my words in your head now. <laughs> but uh, tell me about hearing people speaking language for the first time. Well, in it, that it was pretty. It was the first time I've ever heard that. Mm -hmm. I got very emotional because they made a speech of welcome, and they were talking in their own language and. We're under this old bower shed mm. they specially built because they didn't want me to sit out in the sun. They want me under this bower shed. Um, um, it was it was a, a very uh, how would you say very someone speaking their own language, and we uh, lost all of that down here because we took the brother of the, uh, the, the invasion, I guess. Mm. Uh, did you hear language growing up? Did you hear language? Did your parents speak in language? Uh, I, th I think I did I in the early days, but uh, the, the church had a lot to do with that. They said, you're not allowed to speak that heathen language. You've got you to uh, speak English. Mm. And uh, I look back and in sorrow now that uh, we, we don't, we don't have, I think there's, uh, there's, there's an effort to try and, because uh, there's so many different uh, languages. Health Unit, uh, so we might just play the next little segment of tape. Okay. Part of my uh, biggest achievements would be establishing uh, the Hospital Liaison Officer Program and the new medical services where they should be. We established um, the Hospital Liaison Officer Program to make it um, Aboriginal people make sure that they get get the right services, especially in small communities like Swan Hill. If you came in, they'd say, wait over there, and because the sit over there and, and they'd wait for uh, maybe an hour or so, two hours, and then they'd say, oh, I'm out of here, I'm not coming back here. 
and in, your, in a small community, they'd say, don't go up there, they treat you like dogs. So that word gets around the Aboriginal community very, very quickly. If an Aboriginal uh, person comes to the desk nowadays, he's met by the hospital liaison officer, and they sit there with him, and it's worked very well because it's gone for years. The other things I was also involved in there in the health department was establishing, establishing sobering up centres, which is a recommendation out of the deaths in custody, rather than a bloke going home and he's off his face and drugs and alcohol uh, and he's down the street and he's going to get picked up by the coppers and taken to the, to the police station. The, the workers at the sobering up centre would go and pick him up, take him to the sobering up centre, let him sleep it off, um, maybe wake up and they can have a shower and then they'd take him home. I established that. And uh, also the alcohol and drug workers. We started off with about seven and now there's about 42. Just, just to finish off, and then we'll have a break, Uncle Kevin. Okay. You mentioned um, the importance of the liaison, the health workers um, being the liaison for the hospital, and the reluctance of uh, Aboriginal people to identify as Aboriginal. Um, was that something that y you came across when you first started in that work? Um, yeah, we wanted, we wanted to. Uh, uh, Someone did a report, I can't remember who, who now knows, but uh, there was a report done and they, they said we needed 42 hospital liaison officers and we ended up uh, with uh, eight, I think. Mm. And um, now that it's come down to, uh, it's all picked up by the closing the gap funding and uh, it's, it's an advantage for a hospital to have a, a hospital liaison officer and Aboriginal people coming there mm. to, to hospital because they get uh, get out in the community and and. Uh, so if you come, if you're sick and not well, come and see me. Mm. Uh, and they were, that's uh, the way it started off. And I'm uh, very happy that uh, closing the gap has picked up all that funding up. So those health officers m made a difference, in your view, to access to healthcare for oh, Aboriginal people. Yeah. 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 And the quality of care as well, not yes. just access. Yes. Yeah. Um, is that a convenient time, Chair? We might take a short break now. OK for a break, yep. Thank you. 15 minutes, yep, thank you. Thank you. of the Rook Justice Commission is now resumed. Council. Uncle, um, before we had the break, you were mentioning the sobering up centres, and I just thought you, um, I'd ask you to tell the Commission a little bit about those centres and, and what the purpose of them was. Uh, <coughs> yes, uh, myself and... Uh, up centres around the state. Um, I think we set up about seven. And one of the, the reasons why was uh, because of the recommendation of, of uh, deaths in custody because we wanted to... The Royal Commission. Royal Commission, mm. yes. Yeah, um, to stop a lot of the stuff was happening if a person was down the street, off his face and drugs or alcohol, rather than send him home where the um, people could get hurt. So what we did was had some people that was uh, part paid, I suppose, 
uh, like a panel uh, that would take them to the sobering up centre and let them sleep it off. Mm. Uh, maybe if they wanted to have a shower the next morning, breakfast, and then take them home so that a lot of that uh, stuff didn't happen overnight. Mm. Uh, how many approximately were there set up around the state? I think seven. And who staffed them? Were there, was it healthcare workers? Was it volunteers? Who, who was looking after people in the centres? Well, we had these um, uh, panels that was uh, maybe uh, two men, two women. So that, uh, as I said, if the person was down the street off his face with drugs or alcohol, or, rather than take that home and there could be a big blue when they got home and uh, so it stopped a lot of that. Mm. I don't know why they didn't continue that program because I thought it was very good. So the sobering up centres that you were involved with, that they're not run anymore? I don't think so. Right. Yeah, I, I, I might be wrong there, but... Uh, I don't know. Uncle, how long were they open for? Sorry? How long did they run for before they closed? Probably seven years, I, th I guess. Might have been longer, I don't know. Mm. I, I can't remember now. Mm. And they had some financial support from state government, federal state government, state government? State government, yeah. yeah. Where they, the state government uh, bought the properties mm. and uh, I think the staff was, the, the panel was uh, being paid part-time mm. money and, and the, the manager of the Sobering Up Centre was paid a little bit more. Mm. Um, and do you remember roughly what year it was that those centres were closed and why they were closed? No, I can't remember now. Okay. Um, was it a funding consideration to, that led to their closure or was it some other concern? Well, I'm not sure because uh, I was out of it. Uh, see, I've been retired over 22 years now. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, as the Commission has heard... young man you yourself knew of four Aboriginal people who uh, died in custody. Um, do, do you recall that? Sorry? You, as a young man, yes. you knew of four yes. Aboriginal people yes. who died in custody. I, I did, yeah. Was that, was that a motivation for you to setting up these centres? Um, yes, uh, it was because uh, I had a fair bit to do with... Uh, uh, in the early stages uh, with Richard Richard um, Richard de Franklin who was a, who worked for the now Richard used to come and see me when I was head of the health program and I said mate because he was trying to solve everything he said you can't do it like that you just got to step back and uh, uh, get some help around you mm. and try and uh, get some more support. Mm. But uh, he nearly had a nervous breakdown himself that year mm. because uh, he'd always come and come and uh, come into my office and and uh, we'd have a talk and I'd, I'd say, mate, you've got to get some help, and uh, and that was trying to get him some more funding mm. so that uh, he could do. Uh, a lot more than what they were trying to achieve. What um, actively promoting was for these young fellows to take up education when they're in custody. Yeah, well, um, that's right, because uh, one judge said to me, uh, um, he said to me, uh, and I, I think I agree with him, if you... If you uh, if you open a school, you should close a jail. And I think that's 
pretty sound what he said there. Mm. You got the education behind you. So uh, when I was in the Curry Court system, uh, I used to say to, to a lot of young people that would come before us that while you're in there for you know, 12 or whatever term you got, see if you can get yourself a bit of an education mm. and so that you can go for a better job when you get out of here. Mm. Because, uh, given your given your um, connection to and experience with these sobering up centres and the education programs. Uh an act to repeal those laws, but the commencement date of those provisions has been delayed. The Minister gave evidence to the Commission um, that the hold-up of the commencement of the changes to the law, winding back those provisions, was in line with the recommendations of an expert reference group who had said that decriminalisation needed to occur with or alongside an adequate health response. And she said there are four trial sites for a health-based response planned, but the commencement was held up by the pandemic. Commissioners, please, that transcript of that discussion commences at page 350 of the transcript. And Commissioner Hunter noted in her response to and whilst we continue to wait, kids still get locked up and people still die in custody. So, bearing that in mind and the fact, as Commissioner Hunter noted, people still die in custody, and given your experience, which we haven't come to yet, about the Koori Courts and these sobering up centres, I'd like to read to you a comment that was attributed to the Police Association uh, and reported in the media and then invite your comment, okay? Um, so, shortly after the Minister's evidence, there was a report in The Guardian on the 15th of March system to deal with the issue was dangerous virtue signalling. Despite the government's commitment committing to establishing sobering up centre trials, the union says the government's approach to reform has failed to deliver clarity to the community about the way that the reform will be implemented and how the community will be protected from alcohol fuelled offending. Police remain entirely unsure about what tools they will be given to properly protect Victorians and deal with public drunkenness, of which, he said, 8,269 alleged incidents are recorded on average each year, a union spokesperson said. and their attitude to decriminalising public drunkenness and given the Minister's um, statement about the need to decouple or couple the health response with decriminalisation, can I just invite your comment because it sounds from your evidence as though the sobering up centres that were in place were working. Well, I believe they were. Yeah. yeah. So can I invite your response to what's been attributed to the Police Association there? Um, yes, um, I think that uh, they're wrong because uh, they were working and I don't know why, as I said, I can't remember, remember why they, they weren't with more funds for that, mm. for that, that very good program, I thought. Mm. Uh, because uh, I can give you an example. What I'm talking about, I said to it. Two brothers, the oldest brother and the youngest brother. Uh, they used to lo love a drink. Uh, rather than get their uh, grog and go over the over the river, New South Wales, they'd sit in the park and have a drink. Mm. They caught three times in the park drinking, 
they got automatically three months in Penridge. That's hard to believe, but that happened. Because mm. I'd always say, I'll be seeing you in three months, brother. Mm. And that so, used to happen. So, so three times offending against drinking in public meant three months in jail? Yes. Yeah. In Penridge, yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'll, I'll yeah, I'll put it again. The police association suggested that um, that they, in in summary, you should, there shouldn't be decriminalisation of public drunkenness until they have other tools to deal with those that type of behaviour. Yeah. And um, as Commissioner Hunt had noted, people are still in custody and dying. Yes. So, so do you accept that there's a binary choice there or is there some, I something think there's, else? there's a choice there. Mm. I think uh, uh, you're right because uh, uh, every time I uh, uh, read about someone dying in custody, I, I get very, uh, very, very upset, I guess. Mm. And uh, like the recent one, uh, uh, Dane Nelson, uh, which is, uh, I, I knew, knew some of those people. And you mentioned Artie Tanya Day to me in the break yes, as well. Day. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anything arising from those questions, commissioners? Before I continue. Um, yes. Thank. Thank you, Kevin. And I think that when the minister was here, she pointed out that the implementation of the repeal of the public drunken laws had been now pushed out until November 2023, which of course is quite a long time it from is. now and yeah. of course we, we don't know if that will be the last push out. It yeah. may be deferred again. So if sobering up centres worked before, why do we need to have trial them this time around? Do we or do we need to trial them? Sorry, I, I, can I, I, I'm if, having trouble hearing. Sorry, if, if sobering up centres um, worked before, before they were closed down, yes. do do they need to be trialled as is being proposed or could we... Thanks, Uncle. Uh, you mentioned the treatment um, of the... Uh, people who've been drink picked up in the park drinking three strikes, basically, and yes. you, you get three months. Was your bu brother affected by that? My two brothers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And did they spend time in Penridge. in custody? Yeah, yeah. because of that. Yeah. W what was the effect on them of being incarcerated? Well, I, I, uh, I really don't know what affected them, but. Uh, it would, would affect me to be in jail for three months just because I was having a drink in the park. Mm. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know what, the, what their thoughts were. Okay. Um, I'm going to play a little bit more um, video that uh, talks about your recognition for all you've accomplished. Oh, sorry? Re the rec your recognition. Okay. For, yeah. In 1983, I was awarded the Order of Australia Medal here in Melbourne. Uh, the governor was uh, Sir Brian Murray, and uh, I was very proud to uh, receive that award. And uh, the Order of Australia was for uh, my contribution to uh, disable. In fact, uh, I was involved with a lot of uh, Aboriginal organisations uh, like the health service, uh, the gym and uh, wheelchair sports, Disability Victoria. Um, 
So I was involved in a lot of things, and uh, I, uh, as you get older, you've got to uh, back off and uh, let young people run, run places. One of the real things that, that are, I'm involved today is the, the Curry Courts. I, I'm uh, involved in the Children's Court in Melbourne and the Children's Court in Heidelberg and, and the Broadmeadows Magistrates Court. It's been very rewarding because uh, we don't have a lot of recidivism now like we used to. In the old days, if uh, people uh, got a summons, they just... Just, but nowadays, uh, because the Curry Courts are given the opportunity of people to take responsibility of, of their actions, the main role uh, of the Curry Court elders is to, be, is to not lock people up, is to keep them out of jail. And we, I reckon we've done that pretty well. It's very good to, to see uh, those young people. I've run into uh, quite a few young people that come before me at Broadie. They're pretty proud to know that uh, we've given them another, another chance and, and uh, they're proud to introduce us to their family. As my kids who grew up and even my grandkids today, I always tell them I'm proud of them. A hug and say, geez, I'm proud of you. And I think that's very important for them as, as young people growing up. What I would like to be remembered for, that, uh, um, that a person that's been pretty honest and uh, um, respectful to other people, just recognised as a, as a good fella. I, th I think uh, just because you're old, you're not automatically respected. It's, I think, the way you live your life and the way you present your life and the way you behave, especially with, with the, within the Aboriginal community, you, you've got to earn respect. And, and I think I've done that over the years. As I always say, that if you've got your wife behind you or your partner behind you and, uh, and, and your kids and the community, you can do anything you want to do. Well, Uncle, um, you were mentioning the Koori Court and your involvement in the Koori Court there. And uh, that was uh, about 13 years of uh, your time with the Koori Court. You were an elder who sat on the court. Yes. Uh, and your daughter Rose was uh, one of the people instrumental in setting up the Koori Court program. Yep. Um, so tell us about the Koori Court program and what a difference it made to young offenders coming before the court. Well, I, I, um, I um, uh, as I said in the piece there, that um, Curry Court was got the opportunity for um, the person that, uh, first of all, they had to plead guilty to be before us. Um, and uh, they, most of them did and uh, then we'd explain in, in an ordinary court uh, as you probably know that they don't have to say anything they can stand behind the lawyer and uh, the lawyer does all the talking and uh, um, we're not really interested in talking to the lawyer we want to talk to you brother What's your problem? What, what, why are you uh, uh, messing up? Why are you uh, committing crimes? Why are you taking drugs? Why aren't you looking after your family? Uh, there are so many uh, programs out there that can support you, but we want to know. We don't want to talk to the lawyer. We want to talk to you. And uh, uh, it gives them the opportunity to speak. But in normal court... As you, as you probably know, they don't have to do that. Mm. Yeah. So, so the opportunity for them to speak directly to you... Yes. ..and the fact that your elders who are sitting with the judge yes. in that process... With, with both uh, male and female mm. uh, elders in the court, mm. which, which is a, a pretty good 
uh, process because we have uh, both uh, ladies and, and gents coming to our courts. Mm. Yeah. Um, we, we know from the statistics that Aboriginal people are um, incarcerated at shocking rates. Yes and that this is an ongoing issue that has not yet been addressed by no. Australian governments. Um, what do you say about the success of the Koori Court program? There was one, I, can I tell you the story? That there was uh, one guy that always used to say he was looking for his dog. He lost his dog. He didn't have his kids with him. And um, uh, this magistrate, who, who, uh, who was a very good friend of ours, uh, both Rose and myself, um, she said, I'm sick of you coming here telling this story about the lost dog. And you, you were just about to go into that place and... Uh, uh, burgle it, uh, burgle it, and you come here with your kids sitting on your lap, and you're crying, and the kids are crying, you know, and that he did that for 10 years. Mm -hmm. But she got stuck into him this day, and I said, Good on you, girl. Mm -hmm. And uh, but uh, I don't know what where he's at now, but. So that we, we didn't want to talk to the lawyer, mm. we wanted to talk to him. Mm. What, what's his problem? Why is he mm. messing up? Why is he uh, not doing the right thing by his family mm. and his kids? And you bring your kids here crying on your knee and that could be the cycle that when they grow up, they'll do the same. Mm. So, so what sort of differences have you seen over the, that period of time, the 13 years or so, that you served as an elder in terms of recidivism and people coming back before the court? Has it had an improvement? I think it's better now. Yeah. And, and what, how important is it that the court um, operates with an awareness of cultural issues. It's very important because uh, that's what we were there for. We we didn't have say to the magistrate. This is what we didn't have any any say in how long they were going to, how much they were going to be fined or how much mm. uh, time they're going to spend inside. But um, um, uh, we didn't have. Uh, have that in, in mind to, uh, at all. But, uh, so, just, so just to explain that, the magistrate would make, or the county court judge yes. in that case, would make the decision about sentence. Yes. But, and that would occur after... Sensitivity and awareness of uh, the reasons people might be offending. Did that make a difference to those people coming before the courts? I'd say so, yeah. yeah. Um, for your service as part of the Koori Court, you're awarded a certificate. We might just bring that up. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the certificates... Uh, part of that uh, glass uh, sculpture and as that records um, 
a podcast with Kurt Fernley. Really, yeah. Kurt Fernley. And um, uh, just before I ask to play that, because we'll finish up on that, what... I don't want you to be humble here, but what difference have you made to disabled sports people generally through the the role model that you have been the highest level of participation in Olympic Paralympic sport? Um, you know, uh, so many years ago now that uh, Michael Knight, who was Minister for the Olympics in Sydney rang me and said, come, on, come up here and we'll, uh, we'll have someone pick you up at the airport and come to Parliament House. We're going to name a few streets after people and uh, one of them's going to be named Kevin Coombs Avenue. And I go in there and uh, uh, Tony Fraser's sitting there and, and um, the late <coughs> Murray um, the long distance swimmer. Um, and and, and uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, the the uh, uh, Jackson, she was the governor of South Australia. Mm. Uh, Audrey Jackson, um, and a, a great person. Um, and they were naming streets after, and he says, Herb Elliott's not going to be there, but we're going to name a street after him and Dawn Fraser. And uh, I said, oh, well, I know Dawn, so I'll go, I'll go after her. But the uh, C comes before F. <laughs> so I do an alphabetical order. So can you imagine um, there was 400 cameras looking in your face and the four, four television networks plus all these other cameras going off. And, um, we got through that all right. Fantastic. And have you strolled up and down the avenues named in your honour? Yes. It, uh, um, I was up there a couple of years back now and, and Michael Knight says, I've got six months to go before you go home. He said, I want you to, I think Jordan was with me, we, we're going to go around the street and uh, if you want any work done on it, because I've got six months to go on the contract running this uh, precinct out here at, at uh, Homebush. Yeah. But uh, no, it was very good. Um, so I'm going to play a little bit now from the Fernley uh, no, podcast no. and you'll hear your voice and his voice. He's a nice young fellow. have a, a different coloured hair or, or um, the way they dress. Um, we're all in this together. We're, we're all Australians. And um, the best thing that ever happened uh, to, uh, to Australians is to, uh, to get rid of the, the old white Australia policy. How have you kept the faith and the pride in the country when you went through those periods where you weren't able to have a passport but you kept going and you... You went through the White Australia policy where you've seen, you know, I'm all just obviously saying racist, racist stuff, yeah. but the pride, the pride's never left you. No, mate, I've always um, uh, believed that um, uh, if, you, if you don't have pride in yourself, you don't have pride in the, uh, your country. Just coming up back to that question of pride in country, uh, you would like to see a treaty occur in this state, in this country. Do you want to say something about that? Uh, yes, uh, I think um, a treaty would be great to be recognised in the constitution and, and uh, not as law and order, but as uh, people um, as recognised in the constitution as as people, not as as a sixth floor reporter. Mm. And what would you like to see included in a treaty in terms of 
um, the needs of each clan group or traditional owner group? I think it's uh, got to be uh, um, traditional owners, I think, and um, um, in, in land rights or, you know, that, that too, mm -hmm. and, and it's, um, it's a big, big question, that. Mm. In, in your statement, you mentioned some of the things you'd like to see covered by a treaty, including Aboriginal education, history within schools, yes. employment and higher education opportunities, yes. more protection and conservation of our culturally significant places. Yep. A strong economic foundation that includes and enhances opportunities for various business streams that provide a strong financial position for generations to come. Right. So do you want to say anything more about any of those items? Uh, not really. I think uh, if we're, uh, uh, you know, what, what we, we're supposed to be living our lives about sharing and caring. Do nothing. Um, so <coughs> you mentioned also uh, recognition in the Constitution. Yes. How, how important is it to you that there be recognition of First Peoples of Australia in our Constitution? Well, I think it's uh, the number one thing, and I'm, I'm very glad the uh, uh, new Prime Minister is, is, is uh, going to take on uh, the Uluru Statement, um, and I hope, hope he gets it through, because it's very important that we as people uh, I recognise that we were the first people here, um, and we we're um, we're pretty well uh, um, we're pro pretty pretty good breeders. <laughs> um, we've got a lot of our, our children and grandchildren, and there's more to come. Um, so they got to get the, uh, get it right and uh, do a lot of do away a lot of the wrongs. Mm. What you say in your statement about this is when we have power over our own destiny, our children excel. Exactly. And might I read paragraph 134. You say, before I vacate this world, I want to see treaty and I want it to be recognised in the constitution. Not really. Just to be, uh, to be honest, uh, and say that uh, they, um, we want to be um, recognised in the Australian Constitution. It's very important to uh, all of us as as people, both black and white, uh, to be recognised in the Constitution that we were the first here. I might just ask the commissioners if they have any questions. Yeah, actually, I, I have a question, Kevin. I'm about treaty that uh, Aboriginal Affairs Victoria was running. There were statewide meetings right at the beginning, and I don't think we've had any since, have we? No, now that we have a First Peoples body, now I know the pandemic's been part of it, but it seems to me that's, <laughs> that's a bit of an anomaly. Yes. Um, so uh, there's no opportunity at the moment for people to come together. And I think 
what strikes me, and I just wonder what you think about, that there is talk groups and then a statewide treaty. And so it seems to be an obvious thing to be on the agenda, and I just wonder if you'd comment on that. Well, I think, think you're right because um, um, the, the assembly has uh, got got quite a bit of funding, and it should be shared around uh, by by all uh, all peoples, I guess, instead of um, just a few uh, people that. That, uh, that want to uh, run it and, uh, and forget about the other people. It's all about uh, being uh, transparent with with your uh, with Aboriginal people. Thank you. Uh, I, I, this is something we have heard going around the state about organisations that are large yes. and they get funds and they. They become the whole yes. entity, and uh, I find that uh, some people we are hearing as we've travelled around, especially when, it's, when we've gone up on the river, how some groups have said to us they don't see much difference between those groups and government departments, um, which is rather harsh. But what do you see? What? How do you think that could be changed? It's a, an indictment in itself, isn't it? When you you uh, look at that, and you see some of our people on the assembly uh, being being like a, a government department, mm -hmm. they're supposed to be there for the people. This is about other organisations too. Yes. We've we've heard, yes. but it, it it seems to be there's something wrong with the model. Yes, I agree with you. Yeah, Commissioner Hunter. Um, I'm wondering if. With the sobering up centres, I'm really, really interested in in that. Um, the sobering up centres that um, you were part of starting up. I wonder if we can look into those. And I mean, I'm, I'm sure there was uh, there's some records around how they went and statistics and and things like that because um, we've already got the model, haven't we, Uncle? There's no no need to be sort of waiting, but. Um, I do want to say thank you for being an inspiration to so many because you are, whether you like it or not, and you're a role model and you've thank done amazing you. things and you have two amazing girls that I know and thank you for coming here and sharing. It, it means a lot to us. So um, I'm honoured. I'm honoured for you to, you to be in the same room while you tell your story. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, I've got sort of almost... I was just trying to Google it and it didn't give me a good answer. Um, but I know that have been recognised in the Victorian state constitution, but I'm not sure how. Is it in the preamble? It's a preamble to the Treaty Advancement Commission right. uh, uh, legislation. I don't, I don't know about anything mm. else, uh, Council. And, and in the constitution, but we can... I, I just sort of like this, maybe that, that uncle sort of thought, quick me to start thinking about it, just to have a look at that, and is that... It might have been groundbreaking at the time, but is it appropriate for now, given the push from the Uluru Statement for constitutional recognition and the association between constitutional recognition and voice uh, that's been made by the Uluru Statement? A bit of work to do there, I too. Mm. Oh, well, the constitutional reform. Good to hear. Yeah. Um, any other questions for Uncle? No, except to say thank you. Thank you so much. Mm. Thank you, uh, Uncle, is there anything you wanted to say in closing? I'm oh, just uh, uh, proud that you asked me to come along and be here today and uh, have, have my comments to uh, this commission. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle. Uh, the chair pleases I... Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. You're doing the gifts. We'll do it after.
Yes. Tender Uncle Kevin's statement, uh, which will be Exhibit 9, uh, with the attachments through to Exhibit 911. I don't intend to tender the um, article I referred to, but for those, um, just for the transcript, I'll identify it. It's an article of the 15th of May 2022 in The Guardian, and the title is From Lock Up to Sobering Up, Victoria Grapples with Public Drunkenness Reform by Adeshola or Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, thank you. Council? This uh, sitting of the Rook Justice Commission is now closed. Thank you. Thank you.